Thank you very much for letting me get this opportunity to talk about biochar from cook stoves on smallholder farms in Kenya. Um, so we are now moving from uh, to Africa continent large continent with 54 countries, a population of 1.3 billion and uh, growing. Uh, several challenges um, and some of them we are trying to approach in this project. Um, first, there is uh, the issue of food security and hunger where biochar can uh, have an impact on yields of food crops. Uh, second one is affordable and clean energy, which is a challenge um, for large uh, populations in Africa, and our focus is on uh, cooking food. Um, Third is climate change, which is happening and expected to have severe impacts. Um, and last one here is regarding life on land and ecosystems on land, and specifically there is ongoing deforestation in uh, Africa as well as in Kenya, and that is one of um, the challenges we are um addressing in this project uh, and more specifically this project has been uh, performed in kenya a country with about 50 million people where we have been working uh, in three different rural locations uh, in the coastal area in central um, mountainous areas and in uh, western kenya and we have worked with 50 households in each of these places and that's in the um, latest um, phase of this project in the past three years. Previously uh, we had smaller groups in the period um, 2014 to 16 but the project started already in 2006 setting up trials so we have long-term trials um, ongoing since then. Uh, and this is the system that we are looking at. So from the right we have uh, biochar being put into soil um, and crops growing. And, uh, and that's where the project started then in 2006. But since when I came in and what we've been doing since 2014 is expanding to the whole system as you see it here. Because that biochar that is put into soil has, has to be produced somehow. And biomass is a limited resource. So we um, found this technology then to <clears throat> look at the combination of cooking and production of biochar using a, a gasifying top lit updraft um, gasifying cook stove uh, and that also has then implications on the fuel use of um, these households. But the biochar that is produced uh, is not only possible to use in agriculture um, using charcoal as a fuel is a well-established practice and there um, is a, a potential competition here between use as a fuel and use in soils. And when we start to look at this system, uh, many different questions and opportunities appear and that's why we chose uh, um, multidisciplinary and also transdisciplinary approach. Um, each of these pieces we know uh, be, uh, that they can work, but the interesting topic here is will this work in practice? And to answer that question we have to bring in uh, the different researchers together and also to work closely with 
uh, the farmers. Um, and if we start with the fuels, um, there's a large variety of wood fuels and sources of these wood fuels in this area, um, or in these three different areas. Uh, we found out that people have quite some access to trees on their farms um, and the prunings from these trees is the dominant source of fuel but for very few people it's the only source of fuel so they use their own farm fuel but also other fuels. Uh, there's also a large variety of trees in all the areas but also a few dominant species. And in Western Kenya, uh, it's a species called Marcamia. In Embu, coffee and Grevillea. And in Kuala, Nem and Kasorina. And these are grown for various reasons. Coffee, as you know, as a um, cash crop. Others for timber for sale. The Nem tree uh, it regenerates naturally, but will um, but it's used uh, mainly as a uh, fuel crop. Uh, and these uh, turned out to fit very well with the cooking um, system that we are, are offering since, uh, as you see to the right here, uh, it's a quite small canister that they fill with fuel, so small pieces of wood fit very well. At the start of this project, we thought that agricultural residues would be very interesting. There are coconut husks in the coastal region, and uh, uh, there are uh, coffee husks that could potentially be used as fuel in the central region. Uh, but so far, it's turned out that the wood fuels is what is preferred. Um, and this is the stove that we use. It's um, produced locally. Uh, the specific design is by a local research institute. Um, and the inner canister with the fuel is placed inside and then the pot, um, a combustion chamber on top and a pot on top of that one. Um, and this does save fuel, about 30% reduction in fuel. Um, fuel use uh, if uh, the gasifier is, um, if the char is seen as a fuel, a bit less when we prioritize using that char as biochar in soils. Um, and we get clear reductions in indoor air concentrations of pollutants. Uh, indoor air pollution from um, open fires for cooking is a major health problem causing respiratory disease and other diseases um, and at least we see uh, a major reduction in uh, in the emissions and then and uh, what we measure specifically is the concentration in the kitchen uh, during the cooking process. Um, I'm showing here mainly data from one of the sites. This is the data that is already published, but we have uh, the other data collection uh, collected and uh, uh, are expecting to have it published soon. Um, Biochar is being produced at about 200 grams per meal that is cooked. Uh, and we get a yield of about 17% of the fuel mass. Uh, we, uh, the, the wood in general has low ash content, a lot of volatiles, whereas in the biochar, uh, there's a high concentration of, of fixed carbon. Uh, there's also large surface area, uh, which is promising in um, when it comes to use of this biochar. Um,
And we have not just measured uh, what is going on, we measured in detail in uh, half of the household, um, fuel use and emissions. Uh, but uh, we have also made surveys and observations. Uh, and it, it does function well, but there are challenges. Lighting takes time. Uh, when food is not ready, when the fuel uh, is done, uh, you need to refill and start over, and that is challenging uh, and uh, takes extra time. Uh, preparing wood, uh, cutting it into these pieces, it's uh, something that people are not used to. It's best done when the... Um, when the fuel is uh, fresh before it's dried, but that is not a practice uh, that people are used to, so it's a challenge of, of changing. Um, and then to learn to cook various meals in this way, on this cook stove, uh, rather than in traditional ways. There are also uh, competing uses of char. We knew beforehand that uh, using charcoal for cooking would be competitive use but we found out also that there are other things such as the iron here uh, to the right for ironing of clothes uh, pieces of char and um, it's a good heat source and that is something that um, is practiced um, so in conclusion most families use the stove but most of them don't use it every day because it doesn't fulfill all their needs. Um, then moving over to the use of the biochar in soils. As I mentioned, we started already in 2006. And um, then uh, those trials have stayed. And at that time, uh, they used charcoal from acacia that was um, bought locally, and they um, put in large amounts of biochar because they wanted to make sure uh, to get an effect. So uh, 100 tons per hectare. Um, and then when we started uh, the second phase, we wanted to see how does this work with lower doses of biochar? Uh, so one, five and 10 tons of he per hectare uh, was uh, used. Um, and then uh, we used uh, biochar produced from locally available waste. Uh, and we saw that these were relevant uh, doses of biochar. So we continue to work in that range. Uh, we also did some pot trials with those same biochars. The intention was to look at the effects on different soils. Uh, we didn't get that much um, interesting results, so I'm not showing that. What I will describe a bit more is the participatory trials that we have been doing in the past two to three years with these farmers, with the biochar that they produce themselves in their cook stove, uh, growing maize and kale for two seasons. Um, but first, some results from the long-term trials. And these were set up uh, and with um, uh, control, with nothing added, uh, with one set where only biochar, one with only fertilizer, and one with biochar in addition to the fertilizer. And as you can see in all of them, we get more um, higher yields, uh, highest yields with biochar in combination with fertilizer. Fertilizer only is a bit higher than biochar only, but biochar only is also significantly higher than the control. Uh, and what we're showing here is the average yield over all seasons. There's a crop rotation of maize and soybean 
uh, and we have three different sites. These are in, in two of our locations in the western and central Kenya. Um, so uh, after adding biochar only in the first and the second season, we have um, all along uh, these 10 years, 20 seasons still remaining a uh, large effect of the biochar. Then when we started working with the farmers, we want to, want to of course, to work with more realistic um, biochar doses uh, and chose to add this biochar in the rows where fertilizer and seeds are also added on top of the biochar uh, with some soil between the biochar and the, and the seeds. Um, and these were set up as plots where there were normal pract farming practices and the only difference between the two plots on each farm is that one is with biochar and the other without. And then all the farmers had this. So we got a variety of uh, fertilizer um, uses, or fertilizer or not fertilizer, and also a variety of biochar doses in the range of one to 10 tons per hectare, depending on how much they had collected in the months before um, planting. Uh, we provided them with seeds uh, and of course with, with training and, and help, but uh, um, fertilizer was according to uh, what uh, they had themselves. And in short, the results are that we get significant yield increases in all sites and all seasons, um, often very high increases. Uh, and we get a linear effect of biochar dose. So with more biochar, uh, high, the, the more biochar, the higher the yield. Um, second crop we tried with the farmers was kale. So these are green leaves. Um, and um, we only did this in two of the locations. There was quite a large variability due to variable rainfall. Uh, one of the seasons was very dry and many of the plants died. Um, but on average, we saw yield increases in these ones as well. Not as much, but in a significant, um, um, amount, significant increases. Um, biochar also has impact on climate through the biochar carbon sequestration, uh, but also in other ways. And we set up um, a life cycle assessment, uh, but focusing only on greenhouse gases because that's uh, where we have data that is reasonably um, high quality. And then following the system from fuel to biochar and biochar sequestration in soils. Also looking at impacts on other greenhouse gases like methane and nitrous oxide. Uh, and what I'm showing here is just the, the first uh, greenhouse gas balance that we did. We've continued this work. We hope to publish that soon. But in this first one, we didn't look at the dynamic effects of the aggregate cultural yield increase. And the functional unit used was cooking for one household for one year. Um, and in short, we have the results here. And uh, with the three different colors, that's three assumptions that turned out to have very large impacts regarding the biomass sourcing. Is it renewable biomass where trees will grow back um, in short time? Uh, or is it uh, deforestation? Um, and it's the blue for renewable, uh, the gray here for non-renewable, and the orange is an attempt to see uh, the, um, 
the local situation, where most of it is renewable on farm biomass, but some of it is non-renewable uh, biomass. Uh, and in short, we get um, with a gasifier compared to traditional cooking, uh, a clear reduction in emissions um, regardless of whether the biochar is used in soils or if it's used again as fuel. Um, and in uh, absolute number the reduction is largest when it's non-renewable fuel, uh, but if we have renewable fuel uh, then with biochar use in soil we can actually get not just uh, to low values but to negative values in total. So then the, the carbon sequestration in the biochar balances more than balances all the other emissions in the system. Um, one interesting question now that we've been through this and see such positive results is uh, if this practice will uh, continue with these 150 households that we've been working with and will it spread to other um, households? Is this something that could be widespread? Uh, and we do see some barriers. Um, one is the co cost of the cookstove. We excluded that from our research. So uh, our users have been given the cookstove. Uh, but uh, informally, what we have been um, trying to find out, it seems that the cost of the cook stove, as it is now, it's not yet in, in large-scale production. Uh, it seems to be a bit too high for the general rural household. Um, to learn to use the cook stove is a bit uh, of um, uh, handling, and we've done training and we also did follow up informing the households and, and helping them with, with problems they had. And we think that's necessary. You can't just give people a cook stove and expect uh, it to function um, without draining. Uh, but even if you've learned to use the cook stove, there are some hurdles to sustained use of the cook stove. One of them is fuel preparation, as I mentioned. Uh, that the fuel has to fit into the canister um, and it also has to suit the household and the food requirements in terms of uh, the size of, of uh, the pot, in terms of how much um, heat you get and the, the power, uh, heat power. Uh, another barrier is to save biochar for planting. Uh, for uh, the cooking, um, for for the for the next planting season, because households have use for this um, uh, as a fuel source, so there has to be enough um, drive to to actually save it. We do see some opportunities that we haven't explored, and that's why I chose this photo here. Uh, because we only looked at two crops, um, but there are many opportunities for better biochar in soils. And this lady here, she showed us her invention. Um, in this bag, she has played, put soil with animal manure and biochar, and then she's growing uh, green leaves that are grown locally uh, for food. Um, so that's a quite different um, growing system, um, but uh, for, for biochar uptake, finding the good uses that can give uh, good nutrition for the family or even improve uh, crops that can be sold and uh, give cash income could be a barrier, um, an opportunity to overcome barriers and to uh, to get more biochar uh, use in soils and also to um, uh, give uh, more incentive to actually use the cook stove. 
So uh, then the cook service design, it's not perfect, it's not finished, it's possible to improve it, it's also possible to have other cook stove designs. We picked this one because it seemed interesting, but of course it's possible to, to look at different designs and compare them with the same uses. Um, so for conclusions, uh, biochar pr in production in cook stoves can provide multiple benefits, uh, reduced fuel use, reduced indoor air pollution, uh, less drudgery for women in collecting fuels, increased crop yields. If uh, the biomass fuel is non-renewable, there can be quite large greenhouse gas emission reductions. And if there is renewable fuel, it's possible to get net negative greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we have uh, uh, made uh, quite some publications from this project, but there are also more coming. And um, I really want to thank all the people that have been involved. Quite a large research team of researchers in Kenya, uh, and from Sweden uh, with a wide variety, wide range of specializations. Without the farmers, we could have done nothing in this project. So we're really grateful to them. Uh, also to the research institute that has uh, developed the cook stove, to all our students that have been in the field and uh, uh, our funding agencies. Uh, so that's where I would like to uh, end and uh, say thank you for listening and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much Cecilia, really interesting project and really long term I have to say. Um, and you already got a couple of questions, um, starting from myself. Uh, so I was wondering, you, you mentioned that uh, one of the problems is that either um, the full preparation, uh, the, the wood fuel preparation is an issue or that you don't have enough of it. So have you thought of, or is there a reason why not using a more centralized version of preparing the biochar and then distributing it for cooking and for agriculture? So that people don't mm -hmm. cook with the wood, but use some kind of a shared process unit? You still need to have a biomass source. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't see that there is um, um, plenty of biomass available. Of course, there are certain interesting uh, opportunities. We see that when they grow coffee husks, uh, when they grow coffee, the, the coffee beans are taken away to a processing unit and then the husks are brought back, back in bags to the households and to have a central unit where these are pyrolyzed into biochar before being brought back, that could definitely be an opportunity. Uh, but we think that on-farm biomass is an interesting um, um, biomass source and to use that more efficiently is a, an important way forward. But uh, yes, when there is uh, opportunities for, for uh, larger and more centralized, um, that can of course be good as well. Um, so let's go uh, get on to the questions from the audience. Um, what is it said? Yeah, so Robert has a um, question. So if the cooking time is not sufficient to cook a meal, um, have you thought about increasing the height of the cook stove as mm. an improvement? Yes, the, there are a few different uh, designs of this and we've been in touch with them. Um, um, with the Institute. So that is an option to have a larger um, version, yes. Uh, but what we did that was even more practical solution now that we had given them these cook stoves was to give them uh, a second inner canister 
so that you can fill that one with fuel while the first one is cooking and even light it before the other one turns out. So then it's easier uh, to, to change over and to have a longer cooking period. Brings us basically the next two questions are pretty similar. So what, what is the cost of the stove you used? Uh, or if you can say that more or less. And do you know if there are do-it-yourself um, designs available with low-cost materials mm -hmm. instead of the more advanced design used? Uh, yes, we paid about 40 to 50 US dollars for this, um, these ones that were produced for our project. Uh, I don't know what it would cost if it was done in a more uh, large-scale uh, production. Um, and there are other designs of similar uh, that are, are made from um, steel cans. Uh, they will, of course, not be as durable, but can be done at, at much lower cost. Um. Next question was from Trevor Richards uh, about could cooperative composting be an option? So sharing biomass and waste resources to reduce fertilizer costs? I didn't say cooperative cost sharing. Was that the question? Um, hmm? Cooperative composting be an option. So I sharing biomass so i guess again the maybe putting biomass together i'm not 100 percent sure maybe trevor can clarify um so let's give him a chance and go to uh, angeli's question uh, so maybe we get a clarification um would you be able to comment on the biochar characteristics for the same feedstock where they almost in a similar range across households. Just the first. Uh, the biochar characteristics. Uh, yes, in what we have analyzed in the lab, uh, we get very similar characteristics in the basic uh, energy content, fixed carbon and um, ash content and, and pH in, in the same range. They use different wood fuels, uh, often a combination of different types of wood that they have found uh, fit well together. Um, but in, in terms of uh, visual, um, it's quite mixed how much ash uh, they actually have together with the biochar, uh, if it's just all black or if it's gone gray. And the, the second part of this question is actually, um, do you have more information on the process uh, residence time, the quenching process, uh, and any potential of PAHs that, are, that might be produced? Yes, for, um, for quenching, we use just air, so, or, or um, I suppose removing the air and cooling without air would put this um, extinguisher steel um, uh, cap on top um, because it's not obvious that everybody has water for, for quenching. Uh, early on we did some tests on PAHs and found very low levels so we didn't continue that. Uh, we didn't see a need to continue that because we found such low concentrations. Um, but I don't have those numbers. I suppose I should get hold of them. Okay, the, the questions keep piling up. Um, is the flame curtain so possible to reduce the cost? So a flame curtain method. I don't see that that's useful for cooking, right? That's yeah, if you that's have some biomass with no apparent use. Uh, whereas in most, we, we didn't see much of that in this area. 
there's really a, a demand for the biomass. What is not used for cooking is used to feed animals and things like that. Have you thought about the manure user? Is the manure already used as a fertilizer? Yeah, it's used as fertilizer. Mm -hmm. uh, so Paul is asking, what are the plans for continuing the work about the stoves and about the use of biochar? Will it mm. continue even now? <laughs> I wish it could, but we are running out of project funding. We were very happy that we got three plus three years. Uh, just three years would have been so much less than what we have done now in six years. But we don't have sustained funding. So we are looking for opportunities. We are also interested in collaborations if others see opportunities, because we have, I mean, we have a very good base. Um, we are also, of course, looking not just for research, but to reach out now for to development, um, because we do think that there is a basis for, for upscaling here, uh, which is, is beyond our capacity as researchers, but we need collaboration with uh, uh, development agencies, NGOs, and so on. Um, so, Trevor, I made a clarification about the compost collaborative composting question. So, um, but actually, it's not a question anymore. He wrote uh, larger scale compost systems will be much more efficient use of time and biomass for the community, but this can only work if there's a community cooperation. So, maybe the question is if you see any collaborative um, efforts in the with your farmers, for example, to produce fertilizer, because I guess it, it brings the money to, to use biochar. So is there any sign of um, working together to? Uh, there's obvious interesting things here uh, regarding manure management and the biochar, which we have not explored at all. Many people have some animals. They collect animal manure, they use it in agriculture. Would it be better to mix it with biochar at some stage to uh, reduce ammonia emissions uh, during storage and uh, composting? And, and so uh, I don't really s understand composting because of, of, of the way instead of biochar, because here we're talking about the fuel that people will be using for cooking. It's not green, uh, wet matter that is suitable for, for composting. Um, is that an answer? I think so. <laughs> I, uh, okay, yeah, Trevor uh, wanted to know if, if adding biochar to composting. But I'm not sure if there is any composting in this particular region or I'm not sure. I mean what I saw was animal management and manure, and it seemed to me that the kind of waste that you could be composting would would be used as uh, animal feed um so I didn't see any compost piles lying around but it's it's something that we had in mind when we started but we couldn't fit that into uh, the um, the project unfortunately because manure management nutrient management on farms uh, and the potential ro role of biochar composting here is uh, is very interesting and i'm sure there's room for improvement and then one last question from Robert. Um, was the biochar effect on crop growth mainly due to the ash content? Or do you know, do we have an idea of what, what was the reason behind the crop yield? Yeah, we had several hypotheses, uh, or should I say the soil scientists and the project. But what, what remains now as our main hypothesis is water holding capacity and nutrient holding capacity. Um, 
because it's rain-fed agriculture in a tropical climate. So it dries out between rains during the growing season and with biochar, uh, keeping a bit more moisture in the soil uh, seems to be an important effect. And that is also due to the reason that we don't see differences between soils and uh, different biochar qualities. It's fairly equal, even though one of the three sites has high pH soils and the other two have very acidic soils. And still we didn't get a big difference. That's why we think it's not the ash not specific chemical compounds, but rather this water holding capacity and, and nutrient holding capacity. Okay, I think that was a lot of questions. Um, thank you again very much, Cecilia, really nice presentation. And I hope that you can continue with the project in some form and you get some funding from somewhere. Um, thank you very much.